Well, we have a number of announcements, and I don't have a whole bunch, so we'll run through those quick. We'll say a prayer, and then we'll get on to reading some scripture and into the sermon. We have our annual meeting coming up. That is on July 17th here at the church at 7 p.m. We will practice social distancing, but we will gather for that meeting and would invite you. You don't have to be a member to attend. Uh, We do encourage our members to attend, but anybody who attends or is part of the body of Believers of Glory Baptist Church, we'd love to have you here. We talk about the budget. We talk about the ongoing Uh, issues in the church and things that we want to change or improve or things that are going well. And and it's a a great time of gathering. And especially in in the times where we haven't had a lot of opportunity to gather, uh, I I think that will be a meaningful time of of reflection and gathering and just celebrating because truly God has been good. It's been the majority of three months since I've seen almost all of you. And uh, it's tough to connect online. It's tough to be relational online, but I think we've done a fairly good job of trying to stay in contact and try to keep reaching out and try to keep connecting with people. But on those few instances where we can and do get together, I think it's going to make them all the more uh, important and valuable. So do join us for that mid-year annual meeting uh, on July 17th. Beyond that, when we're done today, we're going to encourage you to exit the building before you get social. So I'm not going to go to the back and shake everybody's hands and all those kinds of things as we've done in the past. It's going to require some change. But uh, once you're outside, then you can be social. And would encourage you, you know, practice safe social distancing, but be friendly. Say good morning. Wave. Probably not going to hug and high five everyone, but nonetheless, be friendly and enjoy that. Well, we do have a prayer wall that you're always welcome to submit prayer requests upon. You can do it online as well. You can uh, send them to us beforehand. Inside, if you don't have a bulletin, you can also get those online. But uh, inside of the bulletin is a list that is a weekly prayer concern list. It doesn't always have everything in it, but it's a great place to go to if you don't know what to pray for. It's a nice list of things that includes Uh, Some of our membership includes some of our missionaries, includes our family of the week, includes things that are going on in the world, includes our military uh, people in service. And so there's some good stuff in there for you to pray over if you've not gotten into the practice of praying through that. Would encourage you to do that as well. So I'm going to lead us in prayer today, and then we're going to jump into the Word of God. We're going to be in Genesis 2, and uh, almost exclusively there I'll reference back to Genesis 1, but we've been talking about that, so you know that, and uh, we will go from there. So would you please join me in a moment of prayer? Father God, again, we are thankful for this day, thankful for the chance to be gathered together, and thankful for those who are able to uh, come in online and watch and join into this worship, Lord. Truly, you are amazing, God, that you can enable all of this to happen. And we know, God, that you are still sovereign over the earth, that you are in control, that you are, are greater than any challenges that we might face. And Lord, We are truly thankful that you are in and through all of these things that we experience. And God, on this weekend, we are reminded of of our freedom to worship, and we rejoice in that, that we might uh, be able to celebrate openly and publicly and, and put the name of Jesus online without fear of persecution or retribution, and that we can pray out loud, God, and that All of the things that you've given us uh, truly that we experience in freedom are are truly a blessing, and we are thankful indeed for that. And God, we just thank you for each and every person who's worshiping with us today as well as in the future as they watch this. Just pray your blessing upon them. Pray that you would find, uh, that they would find encouragement in your word today, God, and that through that it might inspire them to, to know you more and to love others better. God, continue to be with those who are hurting suffering physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, Lord. There's, there's much in this world that was not the way that you created it to be and not the way that you want it to be. But Lord, our, our sin entered into the world and we broke it and we continue to cause breakage and damage through our sin, God. And, and that has an impact on the world and it has an impact on us. And God, we just pray for those who are experiencing the pains of that and pray, God, for your healing where you would heal and your blessing upon those who need it and your love and your tender mercy as well. God, again, continue to be with us as we continue on forward in this time of worship. We love you and praise you in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm going to read for you 
from Genesis 2, verses 4 through 17. And there it writes, the words of Moses, the speaking for God here, he says, These are the generations of heavens and the earth when they were created. In the days of the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole of the face of the, uh, the whole of the face of the ground. Then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, and it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold, and the gold of thy land is good, and the dilium and the onyx and stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole of the land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of, the Syri- east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, we've been in the book of Genesis, and again, I'm Pastor Chris Myros. I might not have said that earlier. uh, This is Gloria Baptist Church in Aiken, Minnesota, so welcome, and we're glad that you are joining us today. And today, just like last week, I want to concentrate and focus in on, on one issue raised for us in this passage, and that is the matter of the covenant of works. We're going to be talking about work today. Uh, not, not your personal, private, individual job, but the idea of work. And the original relationship between God and Adam prior to the fall in the Garden of Eden is, is, is the beginning here. And this special relationship or, or economy, as sometimes it's called, which God establishes with Adam. And a little bit outside of our primary focus today, Genesis 2-4 is interesting in a number of ways for a number of reasons. And one way that it's interesting is that it's caused confusion for some people. And we've just spent a a few weeks talking and walking our way through the creation story in Genesis 1. And then we get here to Genesis 2-4, right? And it it seems almost as if there's this second creation account, right? And and if you're reading it, you're going, well, didn't I just read about the creation account? What's going on here? Why, 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 Why are we getting the second telling? Now, outside of Christianity, there are are scholars, so to speak, who have claimed that by having this second telling of of a creation story, that that they claim that it's just Moses is is thereby making up things, you know, that that he was maybe copying from multiple sources and he couldn't decide which version he liked best. So he decided uh, rather than eliminate one, we'll just include them both, right? Because they're his two favorite versions of the creation story. So so maybe Moses included them both for that reason, right? And, And that is, outside of Christianity, a fairly common viewpoint of this. But I would suggest to you, if you ever hear that, that that's an ignorant reading of this. And and, and the people who are espousing that aren't aren't trying very hard to understand this passage. Uh, That that idea that that Moses was just, you know, picking his favorite stories and included them all and didn't really know what he was doing, um, that, that, that idea shows very little concern for the structure of the text itself. Um, Genesis 1 is really the big picture telling of the story of creation. Genesis 2 focuses on man. 
Genesis 1 culminates with man, right? As, as man as the, the apex of creation on the sixth day, as we've been studying. Genesis 2 focuses almost everything, uh, basically like, 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 like a circle looking into the creation of man and then coming out from the creation of man. And so the whole focus of, of Genesis 2 is on the surroundings of man, man's original environment and, and God's special relationship with Adam in particular and with man in general. The whole structure of Genesis 1 points us to the idea that, that we are small creatures in, in this vast and abundant and amazing universe, right? Yet, in God's economy, we are more important than all of the other things in all of creation. And Genesis 2 simply reconfirms that truth and it hones it in on, on it more in a very more specific way. So, so let's look at that together in Genesis 2. We'll be in Genesis 2 exclusively for the rest of our time. And there's two things that I really want you to see there. Uh, the first one you'll see that comes in verses 4 through 14. And, and here we see God's original covenant with man is filled with privileges, literally filled with privileges. In Genesis 2, 4 through 14, the, the blessings of the covenant of works are set forth for us. And there are three specific ways in which that is done. First of all, in, in verses 4 through 6, Moses recounts for us uh, what creation was like before man was in the world, right? You heard me read those words just a moment ago. Those words in Genesis 2, 4 through 6 uh, are, are a reminder of, of the primordial form, right? The prehistoric form of the world before the completion of those six days. If you're following along, Genesis, you can go back to Genesis 1, verses 1 through 2, and I'll read it for you. Here, here's how the world was described before the creation of the sixth day. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving on the surface of the water. So the, the description of the world, as we have looked at a number of times in the past few weeks in our study already, uh, the description of, of the world is that it's formless and void, right? It's not ordered yet. It's not filled with living beings yet. Now Moses has already walked us through Genesis 1 to the culminating point in, in the sixth day. And from Genesis 1, 24, all the way through 31, where the world now becomes ordered and, and filled with living creatures, right? So, so then now he gets us over to Genesis 2, 4. And his intent is to zero us in on the place of where we are located as mankind in creation. And he wants to remind us that the world wasn't ordered, the world didn't have its form until God made it so. And we've already seen that, that God established certain blessings uh, and obligations for mankind at the very outset of his relationship with us. And, 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 and these verses uh, 4 through 6 remind us that the world, this, this form that we have it, the, the beauty of all of creation, the fullness that we see in the Garden of Eden, that wasn't how it began that it took God to come in and, and to take it and make it and, and go from incomplete and formless and void to this wonderful completion, the Garden of Eden. He had done a beautiful thing in his work of creation. And it's a reminder for us that this order and this fullness, which we now experience in the world today, which Adam experienced, in fact, to an even greater degree, all of that exists because of God's goodness. It's the result of God's blessing. I know I experience this. I'm one who, when I'm outside in the wilderness, I love, you know, I used to be a backpacking guide in the mountains of New Mexico, and, and there was nothing I loved more than just sitting on a, on a high point in the mountains, you know, ideally somewhere near a stream, because I love the sound of the running water, right? And, 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 and for me, 
Uh, I love being near aspens, not because I like aspens, but I love the sound of aspens. If you've ever spent time near aspens in the mountains and the wind doesn't take hardly any wind whatsoever, and as it goes through those leaves, the sound is majestic to me. It, it brings me chills to remember my many days spent in the mountains listening to the wind blow and the water run, right? And, and that experience, and if some of you it may just be out on a, on, on a boat catching fish, and others, it's on the tractor at the farm or, or out in that, seeing the you know, sunset or, or watching a baby deer or a little bunny rabbit or whatever it is. It's those moments. We feel it and we know it. Somebody doesn't have to teach it to us. We know that this is good. This is wonderful. This is beautiful. This is part of God's creation and we are blessed by it. And that is what Moses is reminding us of. That, that remembering what the world was like before God completed it, it was empty and void, right? And now it's complete at the sixth day. And now Adam gets to enjoy that. And as he gets to enjoy that, it comes with some responsibilities. But it's a blessing, first of all. That's the blessing that God gives us. God's intended blessing to the original relationship with man. And if we move to the next set of verses, into verses 7 through 9, those verses in in Genesis 2 speak of the origin of man and and of his original environment, right? So let me read those for you again because they're very important. There it says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the middle of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Notice again that the blessings which are involved with the origin of man and his environment. First of all, man is formed from the ground, it says, right? But God breathes into him his own breath and makes him a living and uniquely immortal being. Man is made alive by the breath of God, right? Now, we know there's various proponents of of evolutionary theory that that argue that man has evolved from things like apes, right? You've heard that. If you grew up in the school system, you've certainly heard that. But but I want you to, to notice that our origins, according to the Scripture, are actually far more humble than apes or fish or dolphins or whatever else anybody might say we may have evolved from. We came from dirt, right? A little humbling, isn't it? Somebody tells you that you're dirt. You're not thinking that's a compliment, right? Or maybe somebody calls you a dirt bag. You dirt bag, right? That's, you know, a slanderous term. That one safely used in church, right? And, and somebody calls you that, and you, you'd be a little offended, but God is calling you kind of the same thing. He says, you are made from dirt. He says, you, he says, you're evolved from a monkey? No, you're lower than that. You're evolved from dirt, right? It's far more humble. We came from dirt. And God formed us from the dust of, dust of the earth, right? But the glory is that he takes this, this menial element, this, this thing that, that short of being a farmer... Most of us don't think of most days unless you're out in your garden digging in it. We don't spend much time thinking about dirt. And when we do think about dirt, for most of us, it's an annoyance, right? I mowed my lawn yesterday and I was noticing as I parked my car here at church this morning, it's got a a, a film, a sheen of dirt and dust from my lawn. Because the lawnmower blows, you know, all the the dust and makes a cloud wherever I go because it's still been pretty dry other than the rain we got that, that one storm. And so that, I was noticing the dirt out there and kind of wishing that it would rain again so I could get a free car wash. Because if you've seen the car I drive, I'm not spending money on a car wash. So you get the idea, right? And, 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 and dirt isn't something we tend to give a whole lot of thought to. And so God takes this humble, simple, menial element, right? And he, he breathes into it his own breath. 
And, and there's a, a, a beautiful passage that comes again in the New Testament, which kind of harkens us back to this breathing in, the, the breath of God into man. This is one we went through a little while ago as we did our study through the book of John. And, and you don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll tell you about it. it. It comes from John 20. And in John 20, um, I'll, I'll read for you verse 21, but the story kind of picks up in, in John 20 verse 19. Jesus is just right after his resurrection here. And, and, and he's come and he's pronounced peace upon his disciples. And Jesus shows the disciples his hands and he sighed. And he says in verse 21, peace be with you as the father has sent me, I also send you. And so here Jesus is sending out the disciples, sending them out to establish the kingdom of heaven, to, to make, so to speak, a new creation on earth. And then the scripture says, and when he had said this, it says that Jesus, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And just as the, the Spirit of God was the instrument of God's first creation, the Spirit of God here is the instrument of the new creation, right? As God breathed breath into us, and brought us into living reality in the old creation as mankind. So by the breath of God and by the regeneration of the Spirit, we are made anew in the new creation. And we see this enormous privilege in it that we've been created out of dirt to possess the very breath of God as our source of light and life. And all of this points us to the blessing of that original relationship that God had with man, God and Adam. Additionally, we see here in verses 7 through 9 that God plants a garden for man. Now that would make Jan Hasilius very happy, right? She loves her garden, and if God planted her a garden, holy smokes, she would be overjoyed. And God provides food for man, and he places two trees, two special trees, in that garden among all of the other trees, right? And one of those trees is a sacrament. It's the tree of life. In other words, it's a, it's a sign of a promise that God has implied. The other tree, we know this tree as well, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that tree is a test, right? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a probation and the very mention of these two trees at this point of the story, of course, brings to mind for us as the reader the tragedy of what's about to occur in the storyline. But at this point in Genesis 2, we haven't gotten to where Adam has fallen yet. So that, that tragedy hasn't occurred yet. At this point, the tree of life is there to remind us of the blessing which is implied. Then in verses 10 through 14, we see the perfection of, of man's original environment. The rivers are described, right? There, there's precious metals that are described. So that man's original environment is looked at as extraordinarily rich in resources. The Bible doesn't tell us everything that was in the Garden of Eden. It simply can't do that. It's not what it's trying to do. It's trying just to give us a glimmer, a glimpse, an idea that, whoa, the Garden of Eden, it was nice digs, right? It, it, was, it was the best. It was beautiful, wonderfully made. It had everything that, that, that man could need. It's rich in resources. There's, there's water. There's gold, right? There's precious stones. The soil was fertile. Everything was growing. It was great. Now, I don't know when this story was first widely spoken among the people of God. Maybe this, this story of man's original state was handed down from generation to generation, and then God calls Moses to by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to, to write it down perfectly for us. Or, or maybe, maybe God 
gives the story of the creation to Moses and, and, and that's its first telling. I don't know. But you can imagine the children of Israel, right? You know your Old Testament. Imagine them after the Exodus, after they get out of Egypt. They've been slaves for generations, right? And they're getting out of Egypt. They're finally getting to go free, right? But what happens? They're in the desert. So as, as they're wandering around in the desert, who's their leader? It's Moses, the same guy who's writing our story, right? And you can imagine them wandering through this desert and Moses, maybe Grandpa Moses, recall, recounting and retelling the story of creation, right? And, and, and Moses is, is, is telling them about how the way the world originally was. And they're sitting there going, yeah, I don't see it, Right? Trees, rivers, gold, splendor, wonder. I got scorpions and rock, right? I, I'm sitting here in the desert. It's hot. There's no shade. There's no water. We're miserable. We've been wandering for 37 and a half years, Moses. Where are you leading us to? Right? You, you can imagine them out in the desert. And Moses has this story of the way things were, the way things were supposed to be. A river which flows in the Garden of Eden, which branches four times, and there's gold everywhere, and there's dilly, and there's onyx, and there's precious stones everywhere you turn, right? And there's trees and everything in abundance. And here they are in this wasteland. And they can visibly and viscerally see the difference between where they are and where God originally intended for them to be. And this stark contrast with them wandering in the desert, right, with Moses as the leader, as he's first passing on these stories to the next generations, it's a, it's a stark contrast and a great and constant reminder that we can never forget the connection between sin and misery, right? They know the difference between then in Eden and the now in their experience wandering in the desert. They know the difference between then perfection and what occurs after the sin of Adam. And so we can never forget that where there is sin, there is misery. Because here the Israelite nation is wandering in this wasteland, in this desert, right? They're, they're still probably bleeding from their time under Pharaoh. And they got the scars on their bodies to prove that they were slaves. And they remember then in the story that, that God had originally created them. And he had planted for them a garden. He would provided them food. They weren't nomadic. They didn't have to get up every day and see, all right, now where are we hiking to today? right? That's what they had to do every single day during the Exodus. See, originally man was stationed in God's blessing, was given water and all of the resources that you could possibly imagine. The, the very perfection of the original environment reminds us constantly of the blessings which God had given in covenant to us in the covenant of works. We too can remember that. We too can see and understand that in a world that is broken. Yes, we might not be in a desert, but we experience deserts in our lives. We experience pain. We experience suffering. And when we experience suffering, we, when we have a world that is broken and it pains us, we too can look back on the Garden of Eden and realize this isn't the way God wanted it to be. Now let me mention two other things. Just like we said that, that mention of the tree of knowledge and good and evil is, it's a foreboding comment there in this passage because we know what's going to happen with that tree, right? I suspect everybody hearing my voice today, particularly in this room, but maybe even online, knows the story of Adam and Eve right? We know what's to come. 
And, and notice in this passage that Moses describes one of these rivers as flowing by or flowing to Assyria. And then he mentions another river, the, the Euphrates. And both of these are geographical locations that are going to hold very sad memories for the children of Israel in their future. And so even in the mention of paradise, there's almost a, a, a prophetic forward look to some trials that Israel is going to undergo. And the first hearers of these stories perhaps looked at those words and, and remembered the tragedies which the nation of Israel had undergone. At any rate, in verses 4 through 14, we see the blessings of this original relationship which God had with Adam. And then, in verses 15 through 17, we come upon the responsibilities of this original relationship between God and Adam. So we had the blessing first, now we have the responsibilities second, right? 4 through 14 are the blessings, the privileges, the, the wonderful things that God has heaped upon Adam and mankind. Then verses 15 through 17, it, it shows us the responsibilities. And in this passage, we learn that God's original covenant entailed some obligations, right? Look at those verses again. Verse 15, the Lord God took man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. First of all, there, notice that in paradise, God enters into a, a special relationship with, with Adam, right? There's nothing that makes God have to enter into relationship with Adam. God does it simply out of his love and out of his goodness, right? God graciously condescends to, to make man in his own image, in his own likeness, and then enters into a special relationship with him. He, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And then he pours out upon him blessing after blessing after blessing. And this relationship between Adam and God is, of course, unearned. It's unmerited, right? Adam didn't do anything to earn this special relationship. And it's very important also for you to see that this wasn't a relationship that God had to, in, an, in its initial form, this isn't a relationship that God had to come into it and overcome sin, right? Right? Because Adam hadn't sinned at this point. When God blesses him and when God gives him this work, there was no sin involved yet. There was no fault in Adam yet, right? And in order to enter into this relationship with him, God didn't have to overcome sin. Later, in order to enter into a, a special relationship with us, God not only has to graciously condescend or lower himself to fellowship with us, but then on top of that, beyond what he had to do with Adam, God has to condescend himself even further by overcoming our sin to be in relationship with us. But in this original state, there wasn't any sin in Adam to overcome. And what is the nature of this relationship, right? Well, first of all, this, this relationship is both positive and negative. The obligations that are involved in this relationship are both positive and negative. There are things that Adam must do, and there's at least one thing in which Adam must not do, right? First of all, we're told that we have this ordinance of labor in effect. Look at these verses. God took man, he put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it, to keep it, right? To work it. And that reminds us of what we've already learned in Genesis, back in Genesis 1, 26 through 31. That one of the ordinances that God had established for man at the very beginning was that we would have labor. And that we would have, because of that and through that, dominion over the earth. And here he is put in the garden to do exactly that. To labor, right? To take dominion over the garden. To order it and bring it to fullness. 
So we have creation ordinances, positive things that Adam must do. Then there's this specific prohibition, right? From the other trees you can eat, you know? See this whole jungle, this whole forest, this whole garden? Lots of good stuff there, right? But see that one over there? Don't eat it, right? You, you, you can imagine planting a, a huge plot and you fence it in so all the deer don't eat it, of course, right? And all of the things. Imagine, you know, you've got, you, say, say you've got a half acre garden. That's a good sized garden. I wouldn't want to weed it. Say you've got a half acre garden, right? Corn, beans, carrots, peas, peppers, onions, tomatoes, cucumbers, rhubarb that's trying to take over this whole side. If you ever grown rhubarb, you know it's very aggressive. And then you have like one strand of wheat, right? You ever seen wheat? Not a big plant individually. I mean, we make whole fields out of it, but imagine one grain, one stalk, just planted, up comes one little, almost looks like a weed. It's a weed. And you're told, everything in the garden, eat it, enjoy it. That one grass, that one blade, that, 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 that one thing, that's all you can't eat. How many of you would be satisfied with that? We think we would, right? But sin. Oh, I, wonder, I, wonder what that, I wonder what that one would taste like. Maybe God isn't watching today and I could maybe, you know, harvest that wheat and make a little bread out of it. Why do we do that? But we do, we sin. And there's consequences because of it. And God tells Adam, you've got all this stuff, the Garden of Eden. Eat it, enjoy it, work it. One, this tree, don't eat, okay? And then he attaches a consequence to it. There's a penalty attached. If you, you eat this, and that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Here we see a relationship, a, a special relationship between God and Adam in which God brings both privileges as well as obligations. And it's a relationship that has life and death consequences, right? If Adam is faithful, there is the prospect of the tree of life and eternal fellowship with God. If he's unfaithful, he will surely die. Now, in that description of the relationship between God and Adam, we have beautifully described exactly what covenant is. In the Bible, in the scriptures, a covenant is a special relationship established and bestowed by God that has blessings and obligations and is uh, of life and death significance. That's what covenant is in the Bible. It's a special relationship. It's a bond. It's a bond in blood. It's a life and death relationship. And within it, there, there are blessings and obligations which are bestowed on us and, and are administrated by God himself. And so, in other words, there's no bargaining when it comes to covenanting with God. Man doesn't get to say, okay, God, I'll keep eight out of the Ten Commandments, right? If you give me this, I'll do this. That's not how the relationship works. The Lord sets down the obligations. This is what you shall do. And these are your blessings. And so we see a covenant established in the garden. Now what's the significance of this covenant of works? I'll wrap up with just these two things that I want to bring to your attention. This covenant with Adam reminds us that all men already stand in a covenant relationship to God. Isn't it interesting that from time to time, the Hebrew prophets would preach not only to the nation of Israel and condemn them for their unfaithfulness to God, but they would also preach, these, these Old Testament prophets, they would also preach and condemn the Gentiles for their unfaithfulness to God. Did you know that? It's in the Old Testament. 
They would condemn the Israelites for not following the rules, but then they'd condemn the Gentiles for, again, not following the same set of rules. And over and over again, they said that the basis was that, that God had created all of mankind and that all of mankind was under obligation to God by way of covenant. And so the covenant of works in the garden with Adam reminds us that we are all under obligation to God. That is, in fact, the starting point for us when we share the gospel. See, if, if a person doesn't believe that they are under obligation to God, then the, the gospel is going to mean nothing to them. And until we establish that, this is where if you've studied old forms of evangelism like the Romans Road and, and other things like that, until we realize that we are sinners in need of a Savior, the rest of the story isn't going to matter, right? We can talk till we're blue in the face about the gospel and not penetrate the mind of the unbeliever if they don't understand that they are already under obligation to their creator. Now, obviously, it's the Holy Spirit who's got to bring them to this realization. But this is the foundation for our sharing of the gospel, that all men are under obligation to God. And as a creator, he has entered into covenant with us. And so we owe him our obedience. And the second thing I want to remind you is this, that the covenant of works was a relationship that was conditioned upon Adam's obedience. That's very clear from this passage. There is no provision for the continuation of blessing in Genesis 2 if Adam is unfaithful, right? If Adam doesn't uphold his obligations. What does it say? It says, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Period. End of story. In other words, Adam, if you are disobedient, I'm making no further provision for blessing. No promise that there would be a continuing fellowship and relationship with God. The relationship that Adam originally had with God was conditioned on his obedience. Now, of course, we know the rest of the story, right? Adam was disobedient. He, he plunged the human race into sin and misery. And so why is it so important that we recognize this about this original relationship, that it was based on obedience? Because we live in the covenant, and gra covenant of grace. And because of that covenant of grace, our salvation is based on the obedience of the second Adam. In the covenant of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second Adam, obeys perfectly the covenant of works in order that we might be justly and graciously saved by God. Why, why is salvation by works, our own works, Wrong theologically. Because our salvation is not by our works in the covenant of grace. It's by Christ's work and Christ's alone. It's by his obedience and understanding the original relationship of Adam to God and the covenant of works gives us a picture of what Christ did on our behalf in his life and in his death. And that is why, by the way, it is so important for us to remember that Christ's life on our behalf is just as important as his death. Because he had to both positively fulfill the law as well as negatively receive the penalty of the law. Just as Adam had been called to positively keep the commands of God as well as negatively refrain from breaking the commands of God. Jesus does the same. And so the Lord Jesus is the second Adam. And Paul tells us this in Romans 5, uh, he, that, that, that Christ obeyed on our behalf. And so why is it an offense to God to say that I will obey and by my own obedience I can be saved, by my own works I can be saved? Because by saying that, it's suggesting that Christ's obedience wasn't necessary. And the Father God will hear nothing of that. So let's remember that, first of all, that all men are in covenant relationship to God. And that second of all, 
Adam's relationship to God in the original covenant is a picture of what Christ did for us in his covenant of grace. It's a beautiful story. I love that we can see the completion of this as we read through the rest of the Bible. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this story. We thank you for these profound things. We are humbled by your grace, by your love, by your mercy. And God, we thank you today for this reminder of your relationship with us. Lord, help us to praise Jesus more because of what he has done on our behalf. Help us, God, to remember that all of us are under obligation to you and that all people will one day stand in judgment before you, either in one covenant or in the other. We must all stand before you, either in the covenant of works or in the covenant of grace. And by the grace of the Holy Spirit, may all who listen today stand before you on those last days under the sheltering of the covenant of grace. God, if somebody doesn't know what it is that Jesus has done for them and and why it is that it matters, I pray, God, even in this moment, you would spur them to begin to ask questions. Inspire them to reach out, whether it's to to me here at the church or to somebody else. To anybody who, who thinks they might earn their way to heaven by being better, by doing more, by giving more. I pray, God, that you would dispel those those false beliefs, those false hopes, and that you would make it clear that it is through Christ and Christ alone that we might be redeemed, might be saved, and might come back into relationship with you. And God, we thank you that you had this grand plan for us to bless us and not curse us, and that, God, you will restore that blessing to us for all of eternity. Lord, we look forward to that day. We look forward to that time that we might join you in the new heavens and the new earth. But until then, God, may we continue to share your love wherever you might send us. Lord, continue to be with us as you send us forth into the world. We pray for your love, your blessing upon us, and that we might share that with those around us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, it's good to be back, and I am so glad you are here and joined us either online or in person today for worship. And as you go forth into the world, go forth with God's blessing, and maybe you'll get a chance to experience just a little bit of that beauty of creation and that wonderment I was talking about earlier today, and let that remind you of, of just how good God is and how much he wants to bless you. As you go forth this week, love and serve your neighbors well. Wash your hands frequently. Make much of Jesus always. And thanks for coming by and go and serve your king. Amen. God bless everyone.